Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for the webinar today. My name is Ben Hutchins and I'm part of the marketing team here at Autodesk Innovise. Today we are focusing on the topic of how self-adapting digital twins transform plant operations with wa and water treatment. If you have any questions as we run through the slides today, please type them into the question box located in the right corner of your GoToWebinar interface. We won't mention your full name when reading your questions and our experts will provide answers. Please note that all phone lines are muted during the webinar today. Now let me introduce you to your experts. Firstly, we are delighted to be joined by Satish Sundarakumar, Solutions Architect for Imagine at Autodesk Innovise EMEA. Satish has previously worked for Emerson, Aspen Technology, and for Ninas, a Swedish oil company. He has held diverse roles ranging from design operations, maintenance and process safety engineering. Most recently, as a solutions architect and implementation lead, he has been working with AI and machine learning technologies of Aspen Tech, Aviva and others for oil and gas, pharma, chemicals and mining verticals. He has served as an asset optimization advisor for BP, Total, MOL, ENI, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb and LKAB, executing multi-million dollar projects for over 12 years. Satish has a background in control systems, systems engineering and, and instrumentation engineering and is a digital transformation digitization expert for process plants, combining his OT IT experience to develop meaningful solutions that enrich operations with data-driven insights. Joining Satish as your host today is Peter Coombs. Peter is Innovation Manager at Autodesk Innovise. He is a Chartered Water and Environment Manager with over 45 years experience. Peter has designed, modelled and delivered a range of storm and foul water networks in the UK before moving to the Middle East for five years. For more than 20 years, Peter has been with the Autodesk Innovise Group, specialising in SUDs, floods, asset management and AI across the EMEA region. That completes our lineup for you today. So let's start the show. Peter, over to you. Lovely. Thank, thank you, Ben, and uh, welcome, Satish. Welcome, everybody. I hope you're all keeping well. Um, I think what we'll do um, b before we kick off and hand over to Satish, um, let's run our first poll, Ben, and, and have a look at who's attending the um, the presentation today. So just, just take a look at the nature of your organization, uh, which be coming from an industrial company, a water company, uh, consultant, consultancy, developer, or other. So if we run that poll for a minute or so, just to see how many will vote, if we can get over the 75%, uh, that'll be great. All welcome, of course. And just a little reminder, in your pop-up view here, um, you, you have um, a questions option. So do feel free to post your questions in the questions view. And then after Satish has run through the presentation, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a run through and we'll answer those live for you. Smashing, how are we doing with the poll, Ben? Super, so we've got 53, just to put some percentages on this. So just over half the audience are consultants, 26% um, come from water companies, 7% from industrial companies, 7% developers and 7% others. So quite a nice mix there, but mainly consultants and so closely followed by uh, water companies. So th thanks for, for that, folks. And without further ado, I'll hand over to yourself, Satish. Looking forward to your presentation. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and um, let's, uh, um, let's start this uh, webinar. Um, this webinar's purpose is to introduce certain concepts um to the to the water um, industry specifically water operations um to understand um, the concept of digital twin and how it is being applied uh, where it can be applied it's a it's a thought process um <clears throat> this is a very open um knowledge sharing session more of um to to also um bring out a, a thought process as to what can be done 
um, in the water treatment plants. So, um, yeah, um, here is um, here is the, uh, the the general stuff. Um, once you have a question, please do um, type your question, and uh, I'd be glad to answer your questions and um, look through your comments. So we had the poll and the agenda. So what we'll we'll we'll, we'll try to first um, look into what is an operational excellence. Um, and how does it apply to the water industry? Um, and, and what allowance does it have to digital transformation? Then we'll go to a concept called model predictive control. Uh, with, with these two set up, then I can take the journey further to define um, a, a, the, the key AI technologies today, focusing on OPM, which is operational performance management, and then the asset performance management. What is the difference? Um, and then finally, we'll move into the data model digital twin for the water industry. Um, what to consider, um, what are the challenges, and so on. So, <clears throat> operational excellence. Um, this is a this is a combination of several companies I've worked in Sweden. I'm I'm from Stockholm. Um, and each of them have their definition of operational excellence. And, and to an extent, um, they all converge into a um, few things that, um, that, that we want to focus on as a production facility. And, um, and the combination of this, I've tried to put it in my own words. So that's why it says HSEEQ, which is health, safety, environment, economics, and quality. Um, that's, uh, that's the groups uh, that we work with. Um, so it's the ability to, to achieve production targets while produce a product or a deliverable with the lowest cost. This lowest cost means that you have lowest consumables, both um, during the production and during the maintenance, lowest impact on the environment, and in a safe manner without compromising on the quality. This, this, is, this very much applies um, to the water industry as well. Um, so what we want to do is we want to improve our profitability at the same time meet the sustainability targets and at the same time we want to keep safety and compliance as the highest um, uh, KPIs that we want to achieve as well. So <clears throat> it's cliche uh, that you would you would come across um, these these components. Um, everything is about people, process, and technology. Um, and operational excellence is is no no different. Um, but it's cliche that people only talk about people, process, and technology. Um, in reality, the assets um, and the infrastructure is what helps. Is is the is the reason why we are here. We have the water treatment plants, which 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 is the asset around which we build people, process, and technology. And the management of, of this um, uh, as a unit, um, it, it forms the, the actual components of operational excellence. Um, so yes, uh, what has happened in, in many years, we have tried and tried and um, failed and understood is that um, once we push technology without considering people, it has been limited capabilities. And uh, we, only with people and process, there is a limitation as well. Um, and uh, process and technology don't deliver uh, what we want as well. So the magic actually happens when you are able to integrate people, process, and technology together um, in your asset space and manage it well. Um, so these components are um, no different uh, in, in the water industry uh, for operational excellence. Um, one of the ways we, we can attain operational excellence, um, the easiest way is, of course, digital transformation. It's one of the techniques um, to achieve operational excellence. So what is operational excellence in water industry? So um, we, we, we had a generalized view of operational excellence, but 
when we get specific to the water industry, <clears throat> the water industry, um, in the water industry, we treat and produce um, clean water and we treat the wastewater. We want to do that with the lowest energy consumption and lowest chemical consumption, which are two major factors. These are the consumables. And we also want to prolong the asset life. This improves um, the OPEX spend. The OPEX spend has direct impact on environment, has a direct impact on profitability. It has, um, it, it, it affects everything around the, the production environment. So we want to, we want to, to reiterate this, we want to uh, process the water with the lowest energy consumption and the lowest chemical consumption, prolong the asset life while complying to the regulatory requirements. So this is a very simplistic view of this target um, to have an operational excellence where we, we, we're looking at process plants um, and, and we, we are limiting to the process plants can be applied also to the network, but um, in, in this space, this is what uh, will, will help, us, help us move towards an operational excellence. Now, there could be other components uh, that could be added into it, but these are um, the core, um, uh, core items within the, within the operational excellence in water industry. So why, why is operational excellence uh, an, an imperative need in the water industry? It's because you know, the cost to produce clean water is always going up and it's the same for the treatment of wastewater. And from a common man's point of view, water is a sustainable and abundant resource. And a common man doesn't understand as much um, as why water is getting expensive. Um, now, the reason is that we have large demands on energy um, and this counterinteracts the, the purpose of water being sustainable resource. We are, we, water, water industry is a green industry in the eye of a common man. And it being a high energy consuming industry would, would not be something that is perceivable. And then <clears throat> when you look at it, also from a common man's perspective, the demand consumption and effluent rates are ever increasing. This is putting a lot of strain on existing infrastructure and the assets in itself. And um, we also are moving into different kind of challenges. Um, this includes climate changes and microplastics that are in water. Um, we want to keep this industry green and clean and uh, meet the sustainability targets. Once these targets are taken care of to operational excellence, we have the possibility to, to, to go into the new challenges uh, from from climate change and microplastics and and and, and other uh, human behavior. So <clears throat> we spoke a little bit about operational excellence and digital transformation in itself, um, but the idea of digital transformation has changed quite a bit. From the early days, it was about mechanization to automation and there are simplistic views as to no more paper we do it all digital and that's digital transformation um, so what we are trying to do at this point when we look at um, a water processing plant which is a clean water or wastewater treatment plant um, going through a digital transformation um, it wants to achieve an operational excellence and um, meet the uh, regulatory requirements. So what, what are the steps that would normally be needed? Um, so there are, it's a three-step three process. One is digitization, then digitalization, and effectively that follows transformation. The digitization is the process of actual installation of sensors, making, making a specific problem or a uh, process plant um, into and, and converting that into a digital domain. Um, that starts with data collection, which is which starts with actual installation of sensors, OT devices, etc. Once you have defined the problem and you have digitized that problem, you have a, a digital representation of the problem in a digital domain from the physical world. Now that that gives you the possibility 
to use the computing power, um, what, which is transformation and processing. And it gives you the possibility to gain insights and act based on it. This process is called digitization, where your IT and OT start to combine. And once you are able to make um, changes in your work processes, um, and you start depending on this digital technology to drive initiatives, and you are able to derive benefits out of it, that's the point where you have actually transformed. Now, um, when I compare with heavy industries, uh, such as oil and gas and um, chemical industries, for example, or pharmaceutical, um, there are, they, 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 had, they have been um, quick adopters for, uh, for digital transformation or AI technologies. Um, this is because of, of the profitability those um, organizations run with, as well as the need for them to also um, get a competitive advantage. But when I look at um, what is happening with the water um, operations in itself, um, there, are, there are drivers which are advantageous and there are inhibitors which actually are um, stopping um, the, the, the acceleration of digital transformation. So the drivers are being, um, it's a simple process. It's, it's water that is being processed. It's a simplistic, um, uh, treatment systems. The non-linearities in oil and gas or oil extraction is quite humongous, and um, and applying AI is 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 extremely complicated. Whereas this is this is one place where you can actually apply digital transformation and um, and actually derive derive benefits very quickly. Um, it's easy to digitize. Um, there are no hazards. Um, um, as compared to a nuclear industry or an, um, or an oil and gas industry. And um, <clears throat> um, the water industry is a bit slow in, in, a, in a, as compared to these industries in digital transformation, but it's timed perfect. Um, in a sense, it's more like, um, like buying an electric car in 2030, where the prices have actually fallen down. Um, and that's because the cost for IT, um, um, I I IoT, and uh, um, operational technology sensors are starting to go down, and um, this is the right time for the for the water industry to to really um, catch into this digitization and digitalization um, concepts and and uh, accelerate the digital transformation. Whereas on the inhibitor side, not being an early adopter has its own disadvantages. We are discovering newer issues. Um, the transformation is slower. What we see is that um, the water industry is heavily driven by PLCs and scalars um, as compared to um, um, and, and, and heavy industry, which usually runs on a DCS and advanced process controllers. Um, they collect data, maybe 10 or 15 samples within a second and um, uh, whereas a historian is not that high sampling um, data system. So we have to work with legacy control and data historians. Um, this is actually inhibiting um, the, the process in itself, um, but uh, it just needs a right amount of justification um, to state what, what are we trying to solve, how much data we need, and how quickly we need, and at what resolution do we need. Um, there is also a cost limitation um, because as compared to the, um, to the uh, heavy industries where profitability is, is directly driving um, their, their projects, um, here we need to have more justification and show returns. These, are, uh, these costs are one way or another um, transferred to the consumer. So um, if it is going to help customers to actually reduce the cost, or to see the fact that the industry is green and it is meeting sustainability targets and it's using the digital transformation and operational excellence to do that. And that's why the price is higher um, for, for the water company. That, that, that's a good, um, good justification because uh, even today we, we, we sometimes are happy to buy um, the green um, electricity 
we see that as a responsible thing to do. So um, we we did speak a lot about innovation, and and this is just to um, sort of give you a picture as to what transformation has happened um, in the industry so far. Um, in the early 90s and um, and maybe early 2000s, up to early 2000s, we had more descriptive analytics. Um, there were analytics, so you could have alarms and alerts, um, basically says what happened, and, and people would go spend time and investigate, find the root causes. Now from there, as a descriptive analytics solutions have moved to diagnostic solutions, a more or less help to identify what is the root cause already. Um, they say why it happened. Um, this saves a lot of time for technician because, you know, when I was working on a an, on an, um, refinery, we were a couple of control systems engineers. Plant kept expanding and expanding. The number of people that would be added to the crew, would, it would take time, and then to upskill them, and then to actually um, get get the work done. It's, it's, it's a long chain of events, and then the person has to stay. So um, the, the need was that, um, being Sweden being a very low um, populated country, uh, we had to catch on with the skills, use this uh, digital technologies, to help us um, with uh, with doing our work efficiently, um, and and that we have enough time for the next person to come in and adjust and 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 learn. So um, when it moved from diagnostics, it, it made it made a big change. Now we knew when a valve failed, it failed for a packing friction or an actuator problem with uh, with a spring, and um, then in the early 2015 um, or so, we started to move into predictions. Uh, we want to know what will happen. We want to see, given these scenarios, what are the possibilities. Um, and then right now we are at a place where um, we, we can say uh, what will happen and we want to know what can we do to prevent it. We want to be proactive. Um, if you if you look at the technologies evolving today, um, like quantum computing, um, this is basically trying to help us simulate each and every scenarios uh, with a normal computing power. You can't do that. Um, you need to have um, a, a much more uh, complex situation. It's, it's solving issues with, the, for example, the nuclear um, industry um, um, industries has ops like uh, hazard and operability scenarios. Uh, you could simulate and you could you could find out what is the best way to avoid it. Um, now, we are on the prescriptive side where we are able to diagnose, um, we are able to predict, and we want to say what action needs to be taken. This is where the maximum value for the innovation is. Uh, we are able to provide um, the optimization, given the scenario, how, how you can, um, how you can um, mitigate the effects of it. And this is where um, it will help us achieve the operational excellence and also the sustainability targets. So <clears throat> the idea of model predictive control, um, it's, it's been there for, uh, for a while. Um, when I was in my college days, university time, uh, we used to call it MRAC, uh, which is, it was called Model Reference Adaptive Control. Um, it was, it was interesting and it was mostly statistic driven and um, and it, it, it looked um, very difficult to implement at that time, um, majorly because of, of the digitization and the data collection issues. Um, and with, with today's computing power and the possibility of digitization um, and digitalization, uh, the model predictive control is, is a child's play. Um, so let's let's see what is a model predictive control. So um, given a certain behavior, what you have observed in the past, you can more or less say this is more likely to go in this direction in the future. 
based on the models, based on the behavior patterns in the past. Um, we will look very specifically about um, this application in the water industry. But the key component is that you have this past where you have seen a specific pattern and you use that patterns to your advantage and you can model a digital twin that will help you to predict um, and uh, the future um, points, which we call it prediction horizon. So K is the actual um, current instant, uh, K minus one, K minus two, K minus N is the, is the events in the past. Um, by accurately learning this and modeling it through mathematical functions or machine learning functions, you can start predicting what will happen from K plus one, K plus two, K plus P is very ambitious. So um, I would say anything for the next four hours or eight hours and a maximum of 24 hours is, is, is really something fantastic that one can have. Um, based on that, we can even decide what should be the action. Now each and every action affects how things would behave in the, in the future. So you have seen that um, some, some, some action has to be taken to mitigate something. And when you, once you mitigate it, the behavior of the digital twin changes in itself. So how, how do we actually do it? So we, um, in, a, in a process plan, we can look at um, sensors and lab data, for example. Um, we collect the data from the process plant. Uh, this includes, let's say, turbidity and pH and conductivity and, um, and also like energy consumptions and uh, RPMs of pumps. Um, the DO, uh, dissolved oxygen blowers. Uh, we can look at these data, we can look at the lab data, we can start um, correlating and try to understand how the plant works. So maybe when the plant has seen um, uh, more uh, turbid conditions, uh, we are dosing uh, alum or ferric sulfate uh, to a specific quantity. And uh, and uh, it, we can see what has happened in the past and how this has uh, how, how the plant has behaved. And what we can do as a next step is that once we have understood and built this digital twin model of the plant, uh, we can we can optimize it because um, based on, for example, weather conditions um, and the the type of water that is taken. Is it from underground or is it from the rivers? Uh, um, so based on that and and based on um, the, the climate and temperature, um, you can start to predict what, what would be the likely trajectory for uh, TSS, the total suspended solids. And you can start um, planning your dosage proactively uh, based on that. Once um, once you also know what is your um, what is your demand on the network, you can start optimizing your feed pumps. For example, um, you can you can you can set the speed for the process plants um, uh, to run in a certain way because you know there are many sensitive things such as uh, sludge blankets uh, if in a super pulsator that cannot be disturbed. You have to. You have to run um, run the plant at a specific speed to keep your storage level um, in a constant uh, way so that it can meet the demands on the downstream network. You want to also make sure that there are sufficient levels on the reservoirs so you don't cavitate the pump. This is, they, they all have knock-on effect and um, everything starts with the process plant. Once you are able to model the process plant perfectly, you know what to expect. You know how to drive this. We'll look more deep into this in the next slide. Um, and given these scenarios, we can start optimizing. So this is where we start to take proactive actions. And, um, and, a, and a typical APC, our advanced process controller would apply that directly to a DCS, uh, or in this case, uh, we could use an operator to validate um, our recommendations, and that could be applied to a controller, and that could steer the plant to um, a very optimized state. So it's more or less like this. Um, there is a car example from, uh, from a nerdy book, 
but um, let's let's say I'll, I'll make it simplify. It says, um, let's say you're you're driving a car, and if you if your car had information as to there are ten ten traffic signals, and if your car had information as to where the congestions are, what is likely to be the um, uh, more likely to be the uh, traffic flow pattern, um, and it sets you and it guides you to drive at a specific speed so that you always end up in a green signal that you never break the break, use the brakes. Um, and that means that you are running the car more efficiently, you are able to reach um, the destination on time with the lowest emissions. And since you don't break because you're supplying energy and you're breaking that energy, somebody has to has to take care of that energy, right? So if you if you pro pro provide a lot of energy to the pumps and you're not getting the work done, this energy is lost as heat or vibration that actually destroys the pump in itself. And in this case, the, the brake pads take most of it and you lose a lot of, um, lot of energy. So basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to see what is the best speed for you to reach from A to B. And we are looking at things such as, um, I don't want to increase the speed by 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers per hour or 30 miles per hour um, so that I don't wake up my baby. So this could be the constraints. So that's that's what we define as boundary conditions. This could be the, um, the limitations for the assets in itself or the limitations in the process in itself that we want to uh, keep in the mind. And uh, by, by doing this, we are able to do a complex model and we are able to um, drive that towards optimization. Um, so what is it with the water industry? The demand and water quality are seasonality and behavior driven. They have very significance in the models. Um, they, they tend to change a little bit over the year because of climate changes, increased populations and so on. But the overall pattern, um, it, it, it is very significant uh, and it is very repeatable. And um, the models are nonlinear. Um, we come from the other side when we talk about model predictive control. We have an installed plant. We are looking at the plant's behavior today, and we are, we are starting to model rather than designing a linear um, model, hydraulic model, which would help us design um, the network. So it's, 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 it's from the other side where you have um, enough data and you start modeling. It's called system identification. Um, but you will have to look at things like um, nonlinearities in the system. So one of the things that um, a normal hydraulic model would do is that uh, if you consider a valve, if you think all the valves are linear, 50% opening is 50% flow. In reality, the valves have, um, whether it is butterfly valve or a ball valve, or a sliding stem valve. These valves have characteristics which are called approximately linear and, um, and equal percentage. For example, 50% opening can correspond to 28% flow in an equal percentage. It gives system very stable. And also when you install um, a valve and when you start filling a tank, the tank starts to create a back pressure. And if you know the valve equation in itself, um, the flow rate is directly proportional to the pressure drop. So back pressure affects the pressure drop. And now for the same opening, you have a different flow unless your pump compensates for it. So these are installed characteristics and these are non-linearities within, within the systems. And sometimes when you use first principles, they are not enough. You want to understand the, the non-linear behavior and uh, the complex uh, variables involved with that. So, Model predictive control today, um, like I said, we moved from statistical stochastic driver um, to use advanced machine learning algorithms. This could be uh, any types of uh, k-means or Gaussian probability network or um, any type of algorithms that helps us understand a nonlinearity and with the PID control loops and the process dynamics that, that I just described uh, once you have an installed system to model a system correctly. Once this is done, you have a more, um, more workable, more accurate model. Um, so model predictive control, therefore, it's, it's very pragmatic in the water industry. 
um, it's very simple as compared to a hydrocarbon uh, industry where if you have a valve, you can have cavitation, you have flushing, and you have phase changes, you have gases, you have vapors. But water is is quite um, a homogeneous medium in my in my mind at least. And of course, water can cavitate, but um, in in essence, it is quite easy to model as compared to um, some of the heavier um, heavier industries uh, issues. So we'll just with, with what we have discussed um, so far, we will go for a poll to where we want to understand uh, where you are today in your digital transformation journey. Given that, are you digitizing, digitalizing your you know, starting to get started the process, it's in your thought process, or have you actually achieved something through this um, digital transformation? You can have a poll. Just over half of the audience have voted, uh, Satish, just to let you know. So, interest. Yeah. I'm watching it uh, change in front of my eyes. So, if you could vote, folks, uh, it would be really interesting because obviously we're focused on the water sector and, and great that you got such experience in different market sectors, Satish. So, this is going to be quite, quite the interesting poll for you, I would say, to see where the water sector is compared to the other sectors that you've been engaged with in. There we go. We're, we're just approaching the seventy percent, and then we'll then we'll share the results. Right, I think time to share, Ben. Can you see that? Okay, Satish. Yeah. So it's sharing. Oh. There we are. So we got sixty percent. Um, are in the thought process right now. So over half are, are thinking about it, um, and then it's split between those that have started. So 18% of the audience have started, uh, and 18% are all, already on their journey, uh, with only 4% that have actually transformed successfully. So overall, this is at very much at the beginning of the of the digital transformation journey for the water sector. So very yeah. timely. Excellent. Yeah. It's very timely. It's uh, it's uh, it's it's the right kind of information to have. It's it's good to learn from your own mistakes. It's good to learn from others' mistakes. It's even better than <laughs> better do that. And um, so yes, so it's, it, this is uh, this is what we expected, and uh, this is what uh, what we are seeing. And, and, and any thought why, Satish? And, and any thought why why the water set? And you know, just just to ask a a quick question, it's. Which sector that you've worked in has been like the most advanced with, with with AI and digital twins? And any ideas or thoughts on why the water sector is a little bit kind of, I feel as though behind the curve, be, be behind those other sectors? So two questions in one there, really. Yes. Um, so uh, pharmaceutical has been quite advanced. This is because um, they have patient safety, GMP, and the standards, they are very, um, very aggressive. Um, oil and gas, on the other hand, that's because of the safety and emissions. Um, these, these are quite driving, driving forces, and you have a limited amount of oil, and you're producing um, um, <coughs> pharmaceutical products, which have active pharmaceutical ingredients, which if it has a 10% or maybe even 1% deviation, and have adverse effect. Um, you don't want to have uh, a ibuprofen overdosage that will affect your um, liver, and people react to that much faster. One of the things I also found was that we take these medicines um, once in a while, but we drink water every day, and we do it in abundance, but the, the regulations are not that stringent as compared to the pharmaceutical um, industry but uh, this is the way the industry was because of this this abundance and um, and um, these two like pharmaceutical and oil and gas have have a very fast um, adop adoption into this uh, ai and digital transformation 
but the real industry that is really suffering um, today and um, and trying to make the most of digital transformation is the paper and pulp industry um, because of the digital print um, these industries have um, and and also the sustainability targets you don't want to cut the trees you want to produce paper you want to recycle it you want to produce it in a good quality quality and um, the the margins are quite 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 thin when it comes to the paper industry so they are jumping in to really um, make use of uh, digital transformation to improve their profitability also get these uh, sustainability targets and especially now with, with energy prices going through the roof i'd imagine that's yeah. that's putting increase in pressure um on yeah. such industries as well yeah no really interesting thank you so um just on that um the as far as the water industry is concerned like i described uh, we are working with a lot of legacy systems and um the the industry in itself is um it's it's bigger uh, in the sense, when you take a water company, it's huge as, comp as compared to a simple refinery. Um, and the amount of things that have to change and have to come into um, and work together and specific identification of um, problems um, like energy and chemicals, um, these are um, these are not um that that driving as compared to if you see you want to avoid a, a foaming situation on a on a distillation column in a in a in a in a, this, in a, in a refinery so the foaming um it costs four million dollars within a day uh, if the plant shuts down so the, the the things at stake are quite high when it comp when you compare the heavy industries to this um to the to the water industry water industry also although i'm slightly behind the curve i wouldn't say it's behind the curve it's watching and uh, it's uh, it's constantly identifying the problems and um, trying to adapt to this um to this uh, digital transformation journey yeah that's where it is so uh let's move on So we, we did discuss um, a little bit of OPM um, inadvertently within within what we have been discussing so far. Um, operational performance management, uh, which refers to um, to a solution that optimizes the actual um, operations, and then there is asset performance management, which is um, a, a most common AI technology that you would see today in practice, um, and some more industries would have already have it. Um, APM stands for Asset Performance Management. This is about detecting um, anomalies within pumps, um, rotating equipments, and uh, and static equipments like heat exchangers, fouling. Um, you. You, you, there are two ways these companies are operating. So they use machine learning um, or they use uh, operational analytics, um, like such as OSI 5, which is a historian. We can also set um, alarms if your lubrication is low, lube, lube oil pressure is going below a certain value or uh, your vibration is, um, is above a certain value. Uh, you want to detect. Um, casing um, um, vibrations you want to see if it's a shaft misalignment possibility of bearing failures um, and so on so that's what apm is all about apm is all about asset analytics because you know if you really look at an uh, an opex um, percentage um, about about 40 percentage of the opex maybe even higher goes to maintenance and then there is another 20 or 30 percent that goes to um, consumables. Um, so APM um, more is, is more visible in the sense that um, if you just want to want to remove a valve from a piping and do maintenance on it, you start with the crane, you plan it, 
you have to pay for the crane by hour. You, you remove it, you start mending the valves, and you, you put it back before you know it's even sometimes higher than the cost of the valve, new valve in itself. Um, and that's why APM was, is, is being pushed quite strongly into the market because um, there is a significant um, money savings with, uh, with APM. But I, I would like to challenge that approach in itself um, with, with OPM. Uh, as in for OPM, uh, we talk about operational performance management. So I want to take this example, which is an asset, it's a compressor. And, um, and I want to compare that uh, concept of APM and OPM here. So if you, if you look at a compressor, um, a compressor's main objective is to deliver a gas with a certain pressure so that um, let's say it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that is uh, purifying something um, and the column delta P is higher so that then you have higher purity um, and, um, and you are producing gas with significant pressure and the compressor is not overspent. So normally the operator would like to operate it at this point, which is the central point. He doesn't want to take any risk and he just wants to make sure that everything is, is, is running at an optimum um, point that is his comfortable point. Um, the true economic optimum comes when he moves out of his comfort zone. Now, when, 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 you, when, when you start to look at uh, multiple variables, which a human mind cannot process, um, that's when you can get an insight through MPC. Um, let's say you want to increase the compressor speed to a certain value, um, and that would improve your column delta P and increase the pressure of the gas. Um, you want you're still keeping the lower temperature, the valve positions are um, perfectly utilized. You don't want to trip the compressor, right? So you want to you don't want to overspeed it. So you want to go at a at a at a central point within this um, economic optimization region, and that gives you um, the best productivity result. So it's more or less like you have a car, you want to go from point A to point B with the least um, you want to use the full potentials of your car, uh, but at the same time, you don't want to break it, but you want to also make sure that your uh, travel is comfortable and you're spending less on your gas. Um, it's the same concept here. You want to use the full potential of this compressor. You want to do this. Um, but what has happened in the industry is that they tend to over maintain uh, these assets and they tend to push it back with the fear of breaking it. Now, the most important thing, um, reason why you have a car is to go from point A to B. Your travel is the most important thing. You wouldn't keep your car and not operate it because of the possibility of breaking it. So your, your operations should be optimized and set how it should run in a, in a very optimum way. And this should, say what is the maintenance requirement for this compressor. Now, if this compressor is not able to meet this, this true optimum point, which is achievable by other objects, such as the column can handle it, um, the valve positions can handle it, um, and, and you have heat exchangers that can handle it. But um, if the compressor is not able to deliver this, that's, that's a design problem. So you, you go back and redesign it uh, rather than running it in a most inefficient point that that does no good for anybody. So um, this, this insight is important so that you can start to look at where this asset is being, um, being the most productive, most useful, most optimum, and what kind of economics can, can we get about it. But if you really look at it, the, the, the the fuel consumption or electricity consumption for this compressor from this point to this point will not be that significant, but the, the productivity can be really low at this point as compared to this point. Um, and this is where uh, OPM comes in. OPM is about um, running your um, pumps and compressors on the best efficiency point. Uh, we are looking at what is, what is, how is the plant behaving and how far can we push 
um, our um, equipment and when do we need to slow down. For example, it's not, it's not always about uh, pushing the equipment to its limits, but it could be also something like uh, you have an RO membrane and you have a high pressure pumps, the pumping, and uh, you need to know what is the best time to take the brine solution, um, what is the best uh, pressure to maintain there so that you can get enough recovery to your high pressure pumps. You've not been pumping too, too much, too high pressure into the RO membranes when it's not needed and the water quality is actually good. So these kind of things is where um, MPC actually jumps in. You're able to look at multiple um, process parameters and you're able to do a proactive action based on that. So the end game, um, what has happened in heavy industries, I, I just wanted to bring that into the, into the play. There is um, there, there are the false positives where you have an alarm or alert without um, without a, 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 a real case that leads to mistrust. So these are called false positives in uh, um, in, in in the uh, machine learning uh, world. Um, and then what happens is that once you have a false positive, you need to go back and correct this digital twin and make it work. And that that takes a significant effort. Retraining and uh, and so on, and sometimes it's it's a quite common um, thing that people tell. Um, I don't understand this machine learning platform. It's a, it's a it's a black box to me. I'm I don't know what it is doing. You really want more uh, more of an explainable AI uh, where we understand why it is doing what or it's when it when it succeeds when it fails. When it can, when one can trust it, uh, when it goes wrong, and so on. Yeah. But also on the um, self-adaptation side, um, there are algorithms today that um, that the models can self-learn and adapt to the new process conditions. This is, of course, based on um, the new data that is being sent, and um, and the digital twin can self-learn. And this is where the the, the the NPCs are evolving. And um, also um, with the optimization engine being a hybrid, uh, you have the digital twin and an optimization engine. It's able to uh, to, to reward and penalize um, the, the predictions and the actions in itself. Um, so the, the, the end game is actually to have a self-adapting digital twin that is able to um, to justify uh, the effort as well as give a more clarity to the user as to how it is working in itself. So the key takeaways, um, we want to understand what are the three steps of digital transformation. We want to look into digitization, digitalization and digital transformation. User adoption is always the key. The more the users adopt to the software, the more it is co-created with the user, the, 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 the solutions are better because you bring the domain knowledge um, into action and that, that creates the magic. Um, on the second side, on, on the second point, uh, we, we are very clear uh, that the operations must be first optimized. Now, when you are able to run a plant in an optimized way, then that should set what are the demands for the equipment and for the maintenance in itself. Just jumping into um, maintenance uh, because there is a higher cost in that, it's a tunnel vision. So we will be maintaining the equipment which is not running the plant in an optimized way. Um, we want to also be clear that we want to have minimum effort um, to maintain the AI solution. You can't spend, ask a technician to spend eight more hours to make it run because his eight hours or, or should be focused on the plant. Water industry is at its best time for digital transformation. Now is the time. Now it's the time, go, go, go. Um, it's good to, to, to invest in the digital transformation. The IoT sensors are, um, are, are becoming cheaper and affordable and they can look at the mistakes all around the world to learn from that. And the digital transformation will drive operational excellence and water operations. 
water industry have new challenges such as microplastics, growing, growing industries, um, uh, growing uh, cities, etc. And the operational excellence helps to meet these demands as well as provide focus on the upcoming challenges of climate change and human activities on the environment. And digital transformation is imperative to achieve sustainability targets. Below, I have just a diagram which, which kind of inspired me how we are evolving um, from a traditional manufacturing to a sustainable manufacturing. We're looking at things such as remanufacture, redesign, reuse, reduce, and recover, which is also very relevant to, to our water industry. Stay tuned. Uh, we have more events coming up. Um, Pete, do you want to take this? Lovely. Yeah, th th thank you, Satish. I'll, I'll go through some questions, Satish, and I'll leave this up so that folks can make a note in their diaries and uh, book, book on the upcoming events and, and Ben can yeah. kind of wrap up because we've still got um, a couple of minutes less. But th th thank you so much for such a really uh, in interesting topic and an interesting presentation that you provided. Um, a few questions to go through before we, we, we do hand over to Ben. Um, in terms of the history, you, you're mentioning that, that the water sector is at a great time right now, but in terms of a histogram, how much history do you need if you're going to implement AI on like a water treatment plant or a wastewater treatment plant would be the sort of minimum requirement, the historical data that we need to sort of set up and base AI upon? This is an excellent question. Um, thanks for that. Um, so, <clears throat> since we are seasonality driven, um, no two years are same. So, I would say two years of historical data gives us the understanding of, um, of behavior, um, seasonality effects um, that we want to capture, um, and we want to implement that into our um, our machine learning models. Um, so, two years of data is very good to have. You can start with one year of data. But like I said, no two years are same. Um, mm -hmm. Last summer was very bad in um, in, in England um, as compared to the previous one in 2019. It was it was 20 25 degrees in February. So you know it's good to have two years to 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 make things uh, more accurate. And, and I think I think that's that's eminently feasible across the water sector with all their treatment works and and in terms of the ot the the actual sort of number of sensors and that information that's being uh, monitored through the process um how do we know if a water company has got sufficient information to be able to run a successful digital transformation process on a plant satish yes that's also a, a very very good question so um so we want to see um, what is what is coming in. We want to measure the quality of water coming in when we're dosing, and we want to see what is the effect of dosing. That's when we can have an effect of uh, or a reduction in chemicals, for example. Um, the 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 number of sensors um, we 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 have a, sort of a gold standard for what what we would like to see. Um, of course, um, the easiest way is that you can combine lab data and the process data um, from the plant, um, and you can do inferential, um, in, which, which means you can synthesize um, certain information from the data that, that you are seeing. Um, that's a possibility. Um, but um, once you have a strong case, for modeling this reaction or for modeling a specific problem, um, that in itself can drive um, the, the, the necessity for these uh, sensors. Um, the other thing is that today it's cheaper um, and also it's easier because um, today you could, you could have a wireless heart transmitter that you could install. You don't need wiring. Um, you need a gateway and you can get the data directly. And number of these smart instruments come with secondary tertiary variable. For example, one of the water treatment plants I was working with had a um, TSS meter, which also um, has um, a temperature measurement on the on the secondary variable. It's, it's just to turn it on and make use of this information. The stability and temperatures are quite correlated. Um, so it's about 
uh, evaluating what you currently have, what are the possibilities that you currently have, and what is needed to actual dig actually digitize and get a meaningful model out of it. And, and, the, and the returns on the investment that people apply, I mean, yeah. what, what kind of feeling would you have on reduction of energy and chemicals and, and a little bit of help on the maintenance aspects? In terms of OPEX costs, Satish, would, what sort of percentage saving would you have on a, on a treatment plant, broadly so, speaking? Um, if, if, the, if, if the models are um, correctly um, um, correctly modeled, if the plant is correctly modeled, and we have sufficient data, um, then um, we, we could get anywhere between uh, 15 to 20 percent saving on chemicals and, and about um, the same percentage, about 20 to 20, 22 percent um, savings on, uh, on energy as well. And and with those energy costs going up, as I mentioned, that 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 that's. I think the yeah. problem is water is cheap, isn't it? Relatively speaking, in terms of the public awareness, people don't really value water because it's a given, and we take for granted the quality of it all the way through the pandemic. It's never ceased to amaze me that all the key workers out in the field have kept our water supplies going and the wastewater systems going, and we've all kind of taken it for granted. May maybe if 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 prices shoot up through the roof and people are more focused on what they're spending their money on, then then this is increasingly going to become. I, I would like to think it becomes the norm uh, in in the water sector to apply such savings. And I'll, I'll just ask one quick question. Uh, I know that we run over the time, but um, from, from from Peter, um, do do you think the impact of prevailing weather? Which is relatively unpredictable may influence the success of MPC. Um, for example, the raised turbidity at water um, treatment works and surge flow to wastewater treatment works. Mm. Um, so um, it does have an effect, um, but what it what it uh, how it could influence is that once you have a model, you know the behavior you 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 have one side of the story quite predictable uh, which is the behavior of the plant um, if if given that um, the the turbidity of water is going to increase because of a storm and more rainfalls um, that is once you have modeled uh, this reaction perfectly you know um, based on based on the trajectory of this turbidity you can start um, increasing your dosages. It's not about saving the chemicals all, all the time, it's about uh, dosing the right amount of chemicals for the right um, conditions. And, and uh, the MPC is actually um, helping in being proactive. Um, it can look at how, how, how the water qual outgoing quality of the water is as compared to it and quickly uh, recommend changes. But it also can look at um, given the amount of rainfall that is happening, which is a linear function of the turbidity, and given the temperature of the water, these correlations, these are multiple variables which a human mind cannot process, um, which MPC can process and give a more proactive action. It, is, it would be still be more effective, um, yeah. although not extremely pro proactive, it will be proactive to a good extent uh, yeah. in the sense that um, it will satisfy the, the justify its, uh, its existence. With, with, with compliance being the key. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so, you know, the, the, with the machine learning, the compliance will always be met. That That's the key thing, isn't it? That's going to be one of yeah. the, the key objectives. Fantastic. Satish, thank you so much. And thank you all for your questions. Uh, what, what I'll do, I'll, um, I'll hand over to Ben and I've got to shoot over to my next call. And it's been lo lovely engaging with you all. And if you have any more questions, do feel free to send in to Satish or myself and I'll, and I'll pass them on to uh, Satish for his expert uh, uh, response for you. Th thanks and take care. Over to you, Ben. Good stuff. Uh, thanks to Satish and Peter for the webinar today. Uh, we have an exciting program of webinars scheduled for the coming weeks. Please look in the chat box for links to register and please share them with your colleagues. I'll be sharing a recording of this webinar in the coming days. Please also remember to complete the short survey that follows this webinar. In return, you'll receive an attendance certificate you can use for proof of professional development.
These certificates will be sent out from GoToWebinar in five days' time. As always, don't forget to check out our upcoming training courses, visit our website for more details about them. And finally, a big thank you for joining us today. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.